It's a go. Okay, my next speaker is a fine woman who I was blessed to, to, to become a friend with this year. Her name is Susan Takata. Uh, she is a Christian missionary and she is a former uh, homosexual, uh, transgender. And uh, interestingly, the newspaper, uh, when they were reporting that our uh, venue was quashed, when they, when they actually referred to Susan, uh, they, they referred to Father Stefaniak as a priest, and, and they referred to um, Peter LaBarbera as a president for, president for uh, Americans for Truth Against Homosexuality. They refused to identify Susan as ex-gay. Uh, that just doesn't fit with the agenda. Uh, but praise God, we're, we are bypassing the media, and we're going to give her a chance to speak and bring the truth to our culture. Go ahead. Well, I, I uh, was really praying to the Lord about what to share um, because uh, I know that when I'm gone, you guys are still here. And you guys, I am so encouraged by the amount of people that have come up. Um, because to me, that this is a divine appointment. And I know that everybody has a lot to do already and not me. Everybody may not feel that you have the calling to minister to homosexual people. But you've come here to gather information and so that uh, you may properly, properly, um, um, properly be able to uh, dispense information out to the young people. And I am so encouraged by that. Um, and that's the reason why um, I said to the Lord, you know, it's important to, okay, um, it might be important to actually say my testimony, but it's more important to encourage everybody here and to give you tools to, to be able to talk to, to, to people in the community. Um, and right now, what I'd like to do is just to, to uh, you may not know, you may not know, uh, any homosexuals out there right now, but with what's happening in the school system and what's happening with the kids that are in the school system right now, that is a major concern with me. Uh, because um, I was in the paper and when you make the school board right now, I don't know if you realize this, but during the 17th, they passed the policy in our school the last system. Time we the policy has already uh, been uh, implemented before, but they, they made new amendments to the policy. And um, part of the policy is to uh, continue to not educate parents what's happening with their own kids in their own schools. And so that would include, uh, as of June 16th, uh, that would also include that if um, kindergarten child decides that he or she was supposed to be a male or female or the other gender, um, they, they will ask the kid if they, uh, if, um, if they want their parents to know. And if the kid says no, then the school board's not going to tell the parents. Um, if the teachers are mandated to start talking to the kid with the other gender, and um, they're mandated to start calling the child by the name of the child by the name. So it is our concern. Um, and I, I see um, part of what the school system is trying to do is to stop the bullying. Um, but they're using that as an excuse. And the, and the uh, gay community is using that as an excuse oh, yeah. to further their own propaganda in the school system. Um, I have my own thoughts about that. I think um, one of the things that um, instead, instead of um, following with the transgender community or following with the, the gay community, I really actually think that we need to have more of an education of what gender, gender issues are. Because um, partially what I keep hearing from the uh, testimonies from the parents who are so glad that this has gone through, they keep saying, well, this is something what my what my own parents kind of said. Um, oh, I saw that I saw that uh, he was a male or she was a male because she liked trucks and uh, went to um, play with the boys and uh, started to um, 
great hiking, and uh, doing this and that. And so they're saying, oh yeah, it's, oh yeah, I should have realized from day one that, that uh, he or she was a boy. Well, I see so many problems with that. Um, I see the problems is that uh, we have now placed, we have placed these things, biking things, and different um, mannerisms that that, uh, that defines the gender, and that's not true. And then when you start doing that at one years old, to, to a child, when a child is one years old, they're going to talk about it. They're going to believe it. And um, that's exactly what happened to me. Um, and uh, because I was, I was one year old and I would go towards um, the, the boys, boys clothes, the boys, uh, boys um, toys and all that stuff. All I kept getting was, oh, um, you can't really do that because you're a female. You're a female. But inside I'm going, no, 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 no. I, I want to do that. So in my own little head, uh, in toddlerhood, I would already think, well, yeah, hey, maybe I'm supposed to be a And so now uh, the media, have really, have really impacted that right now. They are saying, well, this person started at the age of one, or started at the age of two, to self-identify as males, so they must be. But now with uh, keeping the uh, parents out of the school system and, and um, not including them, they're not going to realize that, uh, that there are certain signals that, uh, that the parents are giving out. But anyways, um, and another reason why I'm sort of hesitating about my testimony, I have actually, um, I have actually typed out my testimony so anybody would like it. But also, with the transgender lifestyle, homosexual lifestyle, um, there's different reasons why people are in the lifestyle. And okay, 90% of the people have been sexually abused. Uh, but they may not identify with that. And if you go up to a gay person and say, well, you're gay because you're sexually abused, they're going to think that you're crazy or you're just following a pattern. So what we need to do is not put God in the box. And um, I'm going to pray right now because I believe that you're here for a reason. Everybody is here for a reason. And I'm going to ask the Lord and I'm doing this right now as I'm talking to you. For each person here, Lord, today, Lord, help us, oh Lord, during the day, during the morning, straight from the morning, because you love us so much, that we would give our lives and our feet to you. I know these people have followed you and that they have loved you for, for a long, long time. But Lord, I pray that today, that you'll make us sensitive to the people around us, Lord, I pray that if you want us to talk to somebody uh, or smile at somebody right now, Lord, I pray that you will just stop us, Lord, and give us those divine effects. And Lord, I believe that through this, that you are going to introduce people, Lord, that are in the homosexual lifestyle, that they may be really resilient or really radical because they've been hurt so much by the church or they've been hurt so much by people that they will... Uh, Think that they will put up all these walls. Lord, I pray that you will give each and every person here the supernatural ability to see the Lord beyond what's on the outside, to see the Lord beyond what's in, what's in the uh, cir circumstances right now. And I thank you for that, Lord. I pray, I pray this, Lord. And Lord, because you know, you know, Lord, that when I was getting all the lifestyle, Lord, I, I knew that you spoke to those people. And it was people that weren't in the lifestyle that actually spoke to me and ministered to me supernaturally. So Lord, I pray right now that you will do this in Jesus' name. Because, I'm saying that because we all have our reasons for wanting, for being in the lifestyle. Some of us may not think that we wanted to be in the lifestyle. And we think that it's an inner, inner thing that can happen and that we were born with. Um, there's so many different, so many different reasons why people may feel like they're in a homosexual they have homosexual tendencies. They were raised that way. They were abused. Um, some, some of it could be like chemical, uh, biological chemical. Um, I was telling 
um, Mr. Walcott here, that this a study that was done, and it was on quirks and quirks, and yes, it was on quir uh, quirks and quirks, a study about, uh, about um, pollutants, water pollutants, and what it does to, what it does to the fish, and what it does to the aquamarine systems. And I am a creation, a, a creationist, and I believe, Lord, that because of some things that we have done uh, to our bodies and to, to what we're eating, Lord, that there's been genetic mutations there. And so I just um, wanted to say that uh, this, this study showed that the more pollutants that were put in the water system, uh, the, there are actually middles in the standard area that um, develop female hormones of female estrogen because um, what people were doing is they were dumping estrogen in the water system. And so, um, anyways, so anyways, uh, I just wanted to say that the people that got me out of the lifestyle, I became a Christian when I was 16, 19 years and I rededicated my life in 1990. Um, and that's when I began my uh, my healing process out of, out of the lifestyle. And um, the Lord used non-Christian people, I'm sorry, the Lord used Christian people to speak to me. And the layers had to come off. And what, ha what helped me the most was when people were real. And when, when they spent time with me and they just, uh, they, they just moved through, went down on their faces and said, Lord, how do I help this person? And he, and he revealed his <coughs> And one thing you don't want is that the, uh, the person may feel like that they've become your project. And you know what? Um, they feel that right away. I had, I had friends of mine that spent every day with me, affirming affirming my feminine identity, affirming who I was. And it, I was as rich as rich as rich as I can be. But in 20 years, only through the, the layers and skins and the birds, um, the world just saved me. And so I'm so grateful. And so what I'm saying is, is that when you been a Christian, Okay, you may, you may feel like you failed the Lord or failed. Today is the day and He's going to bring people. Today is the day that He's going to be using people. And um, uh, I just want to uh, yeah. And I wanted to say thank you because uh, so many of us, when we first came out of the gay lifestyle, we were told, okay, now go on. And, uh, we did go on, and some of us kind of fell asleep. We just let everybody else do the work. But I'm here to say that God heals, and God strengthens, and God restores. And I'm here, I'm here to encourage people that want to get out of the gay lifestyle um, to seek the word. And if you think you don't want to, I put up a challenge. You don't want to shortchange yourself anymore. And you may not believe in Jesus, but God will tell you who he is. And if you, if you want to live the life that is the best for you, I challenge you to ask God to, to show you who you are. I challenge you that. And don't settle for second best. Because that's what got me out. I, I said, I want to be who I was supposed to be. And I didn't know who that was. And I said, I'm not going to shortchange myself anymore. And um, so many of my uh, friends that were girlfriends and things, that's one thing I didn't want them to do too. I didn't want to further to get them away from the world. But because I love them, I knew that I couldn't yeah. get to the I couldn't get to the world. Get to all the best of them. So that's my challenge. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.
guests, uh, Susan and Peter and Father Stefani. Uh, thank you for sharing. Uh, now we're going to open up the floor to the participants for anyone who has any questions. Uh, I guess Peter has a question first. <laughs> okay. I have a question for you. Um, what do you say to this idea where, where these parents are listening to these? Peter, I guess you got to stand up to get in the camera. <laughs> My question is, what do you say to this idea that these parents with these, uh, I, I would call them gender-confused children, are listening to these secular experts, and so they're, they're thinking that it's, it's helping them to think this is the right thing to do is to confirm this, uh, this false gender identity on these kids. Susan? That is a very, very, very tough, a uh, very, very tough position to be class. I would encourage you to do that. On one part, the parent is so happy because they finally see their kids uh, happy. And I don't really want to take that away from the parent because uh, I've, I've been a yeah, foster parent, and that's one of the life things that I want you kids to be happy. So, uh, yeah, the, at the school board issue, um, I saw a lot of transgender parents there, and uh, transgender kids. And my heart, you know, I told them it's very short, it's a very short-lived happiness because um, what they don't tell you is that 50% okay, of the kids do try to commit suicide before their operation. Um, but what they don't tell you is that if somebody goes through the operation, one year, two years, three years, four years down the line, the percentages don't, don't improve. And um, I, um, I, I know that because all I could talk about before um, I was getting the okay to have the operation done myself. Uh, I just kept talking about it and kept, and kept being happy about it. It was because to me it was the end to the pain. And um, that's where the happiness comes. And so it's hard for me when, when a parent does come, come up and my friends are saying, I don't do that. I don't get to them to, to not do that. And I sort of do it, but I try to. I still do tell them, but I try to give them hope so that I'm not just giving them bad news that there's going to be more pain. So, um, that's it. Thank you. Any other questions? Uh, we've got Mike Mortarana here. I want to ask uh, Peter. I spoke to a grade 12 class, a former Christian ethics teacher. I spoke about pornography and human sexuality and all of the perversions and God's order and purpose and intention of it all. And as I was talking to him, it kind of dawned on me that these grade 12 kids were born in the late 90s. And we haven't heard, I haven't heard anything from any source, and we don't expect it to come from the media. Have we gotten amnesia about what happened in the early 80s in San Francisco? Have we forgotten what's ha what happened there? It's like it's like didn't exist. And I think we need to reiterate that in our argument and our position to say, wait a second. And I read that same Life Site News article you quoted about syphilis and gonorrhea on the rise. I read that thing, and I actually brought that to, to the class today. And I told the teacher we made copies of it. Let the kids read this. This is the reality of the homosexual lifestyle. And I also like the fact that we made a strong distinction between behavior and the person. I think that's crucial. Every time I hear anybody talking about this thing, they, they don't make that distinction. And the hatred or the homophobia about the person is totally wrong. As Christian people, that's totally wrong. We have to welcome that person and encourage them, support them in leaving that lifestyle and living a celibate, chaste life of abstinence. The same way I would do that with the heterosexual uh, teenagers. The same way we would do that with the uh, married people who are seeking to, to engage in adultery. All that, it doesn't matter whether it's from the premarital, extramarital, homosexual, uh, pen up the whole nine yards, all the perversion, it's, a, it's an affront to God because that was not his plan or his intention. When I ask the kids today, I go, do you really think God made us males and females so we can engage in this type of behavior? 
And what is the fruit of this type of behavior? And we listed all the things, suicide, death, jail, broken relay, all those things. What's the fruit of a, of a marriage rooted in Christ, etc., cetera, et cetera? What is the fruit of that? And they, they made that comparison. You could see it. I had some kids come up and thank me for that as well. And then it was brought to my attention that there's some kids in this Catholic school that want to form, it's heterosexual kids, that want to form a gay and straight alliance club. And so I said to the lay chaplain, I said, you know, in terms of what Pope, uh, uh, what, what Pope uh, Francis is talking about, I would say yes, but there has to be a goal and an objective. The number one goal, number one objective of forming a gay straight alliance club in a Catholic school is that we would support, encourage, and help teenagers with same-sex attraction to live a chaste and abstinent lifestyle. And hopefully those young people with that same-sex attraction would turn around to heterosexual kids and say, we're going to help you live a chaste and abstinent lifestyle. But if it's just a club that's going to enable hookups and it's going to enable a promotion of that thing, I said, as a Catholic school, has to be out. Can't Can I just do say it. something to that? Yeah. Yeah. Um, that, uh, well, I, I agree, with you, agree with you on every point except do not call it the Gay Straight Alliance because the whole history of Gay Straight Alliance is so called mm -hmm. are, are a vehicle to promote, they become uh, homosexual propaganda yeah. clubs in the schools. Right. And, uh, you know, you can't really talk about just the gay activists anymore, the homosexual activists. Is that the um, Sorry, no. You have to talk because straight allies are now probably a, a bigger force in, in arguing for homosexuality. But um, and your point on the behavior is, is right on. The, the big thing is the big lie is who you are. That idea of who you are, and that's why I say it's, it's what you do and what you do can be changed. But uh, you know, the, the, the propaganda is so great. And I use the example of a guy like Don Lemon. Don Lemon is a CNN anchor. He's a uh, he's an African American uh, CNN anchor on in the evenings. He uh, was interviewing some people who were boys who claimed to be victims of a, of a pastor uh, pedophile scandal, and he said he, he came out in, as the victim of predatory behavior when he was a boy. A couple weeks later, he came out as quote unquote gay, as if the there was no connection whatsoever to the fact that he was seduced by a pervert, it turns out it was an older teenage boy when he was, I think, about five, and this deviant sexual identity that he's calling gay. And, and if, if you can say that you're gay and you were the victim of a pedophile, then you could say you're gay for anything. And so, I, and I think this is a key argument. You know, you look at the lives, there's a lot of trauma in the lives of, of homosexuals, lesbians, and uh, bisexuals and transgenders. Early childhood <coughs> trauma uh, and, and a lot of abuse. And we have to say that common sense says that if a boy, <coughs> in his case, five years old, uh, his first sexual act is this deviant act with an older uh, young man, <coughs> of course uh, it's more likely that he will embrace a deviant identity. But how does the media treat it? The media basically treats everything as born gay. Even though the evidence for born gay is, is, is nil, uh, the studies were not replicated. In fact, the twin studies, the more twin studies they do, the, the farther away they get uh, from uh, uh, from the, uh, the idea of born gay. And the guy to read on that is Neil Whitehead. Doctor, I think it's Dr. Neil Whitehead. From, he's a New Zealand doctor. He's a... Uh, very well read and, and uh, esteemed on this issue, and he says that the newer twin studies are even more refutation of born gay. But yeah, we have to get back to behavior, and the AIDS, uh, you look back in the 70s, I'm reading a book called Anne the Band Played On by Randy Schultz, who's a homosexual who died at a young age. We're, it's basically we're reliving all of these all of what happened in the 70s. The difference is now they've, they've spent so much money and they've got these drugs that are basically covering up the effects that happen. The latest drug is called, it's, it's PrEP, it's called Truvada, and basically the, the, you can take it to lower your likelihood of getting HIV, but this is a, a very expensive drug. It, many, even homosexuals, believe that it will encourage promiscuity because people are going to take the drug and think, oh, I'm safe, and they're going to go out and engage in these, uh, hot, I, call it homo, I call it homo promiscuity because homosexual promiscuity among men is, is just in a league all its own. It's hard, it's so, it's so, promiscuous, it's almost hard for most people, say, dare I say, normal people, to conceive 
conceive of it, you know, the bathhouse situations where men are you know, literally having hundreds of partners, you know, in their lifetime, some over a thousand. Um, and, and so, you know, now you're going to see homosexual men taking this drug and then engage, continuing to engage in these behaviors, and that uh, could be very dangerous. You did the intention of talking to one from the United States. We had him off here one time about 25 years ago. And, he, and I just happened to be a, get on one of his links. And all the new information and the new stats and this new fasciitis that they're, they're experiencing, the case we're experiencing that there isn't, there isn't a drug for and it's spreading across the big cities of the United States. Do you know Paul Cameron? Yes, yes. Paul Cameron? Yeah, and Paul, Paul gets really and good Paul Cameron from a very, for a yeah. long time, will try to sort of educate people on yeah. what homosexuals do. And, okay. and, um, he, he has really been vilified, almost <laughs> more than Bill Watcott. Yeah. I mean, because he, he tried to get out the, the results and what they were doing. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Can I add something to that? Uh, let, uh, yeah, stand yeah. up. Yeah, um, yeah, okay. I just wanted to let you know, because um, one of the things that I've been doing lately is been going to uh, speak with Eucharist. And basically what I do is I am... Uh, I put them in a circle, right? And, we, and anyways, I ask questions. But um, one of the things I found out that it's really, 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 it took me, it takes me a while sometimes to get the kids to realize that they're not getting all the information. And so many of them don't even know that they have to ask questions. And, or it's, it's out of, it's, it's out of their, even their, their imaginations to think that a person like myself is not allowed to go in there. And, and, or else go in there and talk to people. So they think that they're getting all the information and that's why they, they might be, um, uh, and they're not yet. Any other questions, comments? I was, I was asking, when you were talking about children, what age group of children are you talking about when you're talking about uh, introducing them to the gay lifestyle or um, five? Five? Oh, yeah, I yeah. realize. Okay. Um, well, kids are orientated according, like, I always, not always thought, I've been reading and I know from talking to various gays, men, that uh, many of them have, have had a bad relationship with dad, with their fathers, okay? Uh, is that still sort of the thought process or has it gone beyond that because of the uh, gay agenda being introduced into the educational system? Well, they, 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 do, they do still talk about that, but um, um, a, lot of, a lot of people just want to blank that out, or they, they just don't they they just express it. And yeah. Deny. Yeah. I, just, I just heard uh, Stephen Black, he spoke at our banquet, he's a former homosexual, and he, uh, he used the term, I think it was arrested emotional development. You know, the, the, the uh, uh, deficit of, uh, in the relationship with the father in which they, which they try to make up for in the wrong way. Oh, and yeah, they um, meet up with a gay, maybe 10 years the senior of the one that has uh, the young Yeah, I mean, well, there's a whole, there's a whole subcategory, I mean, homosexual men where the daddy board relationships, that's literally what they're called. Um, uh, you know, so, so this is something that, and, and again, homosexual activists will always deny these things. But they're simply observable. Anybody who studied it, to, you know, obviously, so many homosexual men talk about a, 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 a dysfunctional or a bad relationship with their father, and um, and you know, and yet we have to get over just the, the basically the media propaganda is sort of a fundamentalism. Nothing is tolerated which would break the gay argument. They they accuse us. Of, they hate fundamentalists. Be they of whatever type. A fundamentalist to them would be anybody who adheres to a absolute truth. Whether you're Catholic, yeah. Protestant, they're, they're fundamental. But what, what I call what I call gay fundamentalism is gay fundamentalism. Nothing is tolerated in your circular reasoning, which would which would denigrate the gay argument, which would see which would break the gay argument. And so, if somebody changes, somebody left the homosexual lifestyle. What's their answer? Well, maybe they weren't gay. Yeah. Oh, they, maybe they weren't gay in the first place. And and I, and, I, and as far as change goes. Uh, uh, you know, they focus on the failures. In, in America, as I'm sure here, every time there's somebody who was ex-gay and then goes back into the homosexual lifestyle, the, the homosexual movement jumps up and down. And I thought to myself, what other area of life do we celebrate failure? Mm -hmm. Can you imagine a guy breaks, goes, he become, breaks free of a drug addiction and then goes back into drugs and everybody says, see, you can't change. Only in this area of life 
is there a whole strong lobby political movement which celebrates failure. And we need to celebrate people like Susan because that's what normal society does. And the first, it's just like the abortion thing. Isn't that a part of the failure thing? If you really look at it, it's a negative thing that should not happen. This child that was conceived should have never been conceived, maybe, or, you know, something has happened and that child is not being accepted. It's a God's gift to the person who has it, but they don't want it. And it's the same thing with gays. Gays are orientated to the same sex uh, a, a love affair. It's a, a lust. It, it's a transcendent between love. They're wanting love so much that they're going into the lust area with the same sex. And the thing, the sexual act itself is a perversion, physically a perversion. I remember, <laughs> I was, uh, I'm uh, an artist as well as many other things, but I trained at the College of Art in Toronto. And um, one of my colleagues, who was a very, very bright artist, very bright man, uh, some of my friends told me, you know, go to Carl and see, he's gay, he's gay. If I hadn't used my common sense in my brain, I would have said, no, he's not gay. Because why? He loves my girlfriend, Joan, one, and he, he paints and he likes to draw female figures as opposed to male figures. So does that show that he's gay? Well, I wasn't thinking. So I, I went on to him and I somehow put the question to him that, you know, are you gay? I didn't say that directly. And he looked at me with daggers in his eyes. And he said, Rosemary, he said, get this and get it straight and remember it for as long as you live. Keep it in your brain. He said, the parts don't fit. And I'll never forget that, because that is the way it is with the male sexual, uh, what you may call them, act, act, with men and men, and that's the way it is with women and women too. They're normal, totally abnormal, and if you use your head, you will know you'll not, down, you'll not go into that area. It's a no-no.